Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sego Ani Buju Wachaya Kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So with that, we will officially call to order. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mayor Patterson, we have quorum. Okay, we have nothing under Committee of the Whole closed meeting, so we will move to approval of the adits. Uh, we have some uh, motions of congratulations and condolences. Uh, we have a revised note on the report from the Planning Committee and the addition of a report from the Nominations Advisory Committee. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Hutchison. Please vote. <coughs> and that carries. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Uh, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you, I, Ryan Bohm, the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause F Report Number 32 as an employee of Utilities Kingston. It may be perceived that I have pecuniary interest in this matter. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you. Councillor Candon. Thank you. And through you, uh, I, Adam Candon, of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, Declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of report number 34, uh, received from the Planning Committee as I am a licensed realtor. Also, I, Adam Candon of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of report number 32, Clause G, as I have, I currently have site plan control securities with the city. Thank you, Councillor Hutchison. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, Rob Hutchison, of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of uh, Clause G, Report Number 32, as my employer, Kingston Cooperative Homes, Inc., is currently in negotiations with the city regarding site plan control securities. Okay. Seeing no other um, declarations of pecuniary interest, we will move on. We have no presentations this evening. We have no delegations. We have no briefings. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, Deputy Mayor. Yes, um, uh, moved by myself and uh, seconded by Councillor Stroud, and I shared this information with the clerks earlier. Uh, be it resolved that bylaw 1B waived by council to allow Christine Sip Sipowicz to come in delegation to speak to the official plan in relation to large retail in the downtown co core. Okay, so we have a motion to add a delegation. A move by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Stroud, is that Okay, we'll call the vote. And that carries. Uh, so with that, we will invite Ms. Sipnovich to uh, come and speak to council with respect to uh, report number 34, clause A. And just a reminder, you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition of Kingston Communities, an umbrella organization of over 20 community groups dedicated to improving processes of civic engagement and accountability at City Hall. Uh, this evening, Council is considering a new official plan. The official plan is the vision for what kind of city we want to be. 
setting out the principles and guidelines that will direct council and staff as they make a myriad of important decisions about urban planning in Kingston. What the city began as a technical review of the 2010 official plan, a tweaking exercise, grew into a much more extensive undertaking. You have before you draft six, a 600 page document reflecting over 1500 changes. The public has certainly been invited to participate in the process. There have been many meetings and opportunities for input. Staff have been responsive and listened and have worked tremendously hard. Public engagement is required by the Planning Act for good reason. We all benefit from a plan that is the fruits of wide consultation. However, the city faltered in fulfilling its obligations under the Planning Act at the outset by not beginning the process with a required open house. It then had to play catch up and schedule the required meeting quite late in the process. And a procedural misstep is unfortunately again at issue now. It is our understanding that part three, section 1715D of the Planning Act requires a final public meeting with respect to the final proposed plan. And this has not happened. The last time that the public was able to attend a planning committee meeting and speak was on November 17, 2016 in connection with draft five that was dated September 21, 2016. There was a previous draft five dated August 23, 2016. The two draft fives are different. Yes, it is confusing. We know of at least one significant change to the section now allowing large format retail downtown in section 34A5 in a section entitled prohibited uses. This was not in the August 23rd, 2016 draft five, nor was it highlighted in the materials presented at the October open house or the November planning committee meeting. This raises the issue of what fair process and consultation actually mean. Is it the responsibility of the city to highlight changes of importance to the public and to you, our elected officials? The coalition is not here to debate the merits of the change. We want to draw your attention to the problems of process this change raises. We appreciate that you do not want to meet forever about the official plan, neither do we. But if the document keeps changing, then we, the people of Kingston, want to know about it and the city is required by law to give us that opportunity. Moreover, engagement with the public should be assisted with a plan that is couched in clear and precise language and guidance from staff that identifies all the key changes in the plan. Big box retail downtown is one of those key changes that should have been brought forward in a staff report before now. We are happy to note that the draft plan has two important commitments, section 9, 12, 3, and 4, with respect to public engagement that are required under the Planning Act. However, the discussion document currently in circulation on this matter makes no reference to the Planning Act's provisions for public engagement set out in Bill 73, which speaks to procedures for informing and obtaining the views of the public regarding the official plan, zoning changes, plans of subdivision and consents, and other planning matters. And the discussion document seems to work with an old fashioned top down model of disseminating information rather than one based on soliciting community input. I want to stress again how hard staff have worked and how patient they have been in their dealings with the public. That's very much appreciated. However, let's get this right and move on. Please defer a decision on this final draft of the official plan until there's been a public meeting to explain the changes in this final document. And then let's stop messing with it and work expeditiously on a community engagement plan as required by law that enables genuine processes of consultation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for the delegation? Yes. Uh, Councillor Stratton. Thank you, Worship. And thank you for your delegation. I was wondering <clears throat> if uh, by way of public explanation, questions tonight when we come to this in the agenda would be sufficient uh, to inform the public in your opinion? Well, I mean, a public meeting is a little bit different because there is an opportunity for the public to engage, um, which wouldn't be the case this evening, yeah. And I have a different question to do with the 
uh, adherence to the official plan uh, and, and the, the perspective of the coalition. Do you believe, it, you at the coalition, do you have consensus of belief over uh, how uh, the bureaucracy of the city has been adhering to the official plan before the update? Oh, you mean the, sort of like the previous official plan? Um, well, <laughs> that's a kind of another can of worms, if you like. Um, but certainly, it can be a little disheartening about all the effort that's put into, you know, the ideal official plan, um, whether or not it actually will have any bite in terms of guiding planning decisions. So I guess there's evidence to suggest that the official plan is often deviated from in, in, in important decisions in the city. Yeah. That's Thank a concern. You. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, seeing no other questions, Deputy Mayor Neal. Just very quickly, um, if you have uh, a hard copy of any of your oh, presentation, that could come as official correspondence. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. And thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, moving on, do we have any, uh, we have no briefings tonight, do we have any petitions? Seeing none, uh, we do have some motions of congratulations and condolence. Uh, moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Mayor Patterson, that the congratulations of Kingston City Council be extended to the Berryfield Village Association, which was honored with the Lieutenant Governor's Ontario Heritage Award for Excellence in Conservation on February 17th for its celebrations of the 200th anniversary of Berryfield. The annual Lieutenant Governor's Ontario Heritage Awards recognize exceptional contributions to cultural and natural heritage conservation, environmental sustainability, and biodiversity. Motions of condolence. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to Nicole Phillips, Human Resources and Organization Development Services, on the passing of her loving father, Carl Heinz Neiman, a longtime dedicated employee of Correctional Services of Canada. Carl Heinz Neiman will be greatly missed by his extensive family and many friends. Moved by Deputy Mayor, Mayor Neal, seconded by Mayor Patterson, that the sin sincere condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the many friends and family of Dennis Curtis, who passed away recently. Dennis is best known as a theater icon in Kingston, having performed in many community plays frequently at the Grand Theater. He was also a longtime employee at Correctional Services of Canada, working in public relations. His talent and humor will be missed. Moved by Councillor Holland, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to Warren Smokey Thomas, Provincial OPSU President on the passing of his mother, Mary G. Thomas. She is survived by seven sons and daughters and numerous grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Our sympathy to all Mrs. Thomas's friends and family. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to Rob Crothers, project engineer, facilities management and construction services, and his family on the death of his mother, Catherine Crothers. Catherine was a wonderful mother, nurse, author, and artist who loved Kingston and all its stories. She will be missed. So we will call the vote. And that carries. We have no deferred motions, so we will move on to reports. First report number 32 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that report number 32 from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. Um, I would point out that there are two clauses, G and F, that uh, we will need to separate for uh, pecuniary. Okay, so G and F have been separated. Are there any other uh, clauses that council wishes to separate. Councillor Hutchison? D for dog. D. Councillor Sanek? Clause C, the front road bridge. Councillor Turner? Okay. okay, so first we will vote on the balance of the items. So first we have Clause A, award of contract, corporate records, storage space, and the provision of related services. Clause B, award of contract recycling truck. Clause E, collapse of the Portsmouth Village Millennium Trust Fund. Clause H, innovative immigration initiatives funding. We will call the vote. And that carries. Clause C, award of contract front road bridge phase two. Councillor Sanic. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have a couple of questions um, to, through you to staff. Um, when the work will begin, when it was uh, predicted to end, um, I know when the Front Road Bridge um, started in 2015, it started in September, and some drivers were upset because that's the height of traffic season with the Queens students, all the professors driving into Queens. So I just wondered when it's starting this year, when it's um, predicted to be finished, it will still be going down to one lane again in each direction. And will all the drivers be notified before we get those lane reductions? Thank you. Mr. Keach? Through you, Your Worship, I'll try and capture all the questions. If I, uh, if I omit any, just please ask them again. So um, if, this is award, if this is approved tonight, we will move to um, award the RFP as quickly as possible. Um, believe it or not, we are getting close to spring, and uh, we would look for the contractor to start relatively soon when we get the paperwork and whatnot in order. Um, one of the things um, that we liked about the proposal uh, was the, uh, the uh, detailed schedule and the dewatering process, which was some of the issues last go around. Um, currently, we are uh, hoping to have this finished um, uh, end of summer, um, end of August-ish, um, in, in that timeline. So I'd say if all goes well before we get into the season that you were, uh, that you were uh, concerned about. Um, as far as traffic flow goes, um, you are correct. It will be down to uh, one lane each way. Um, I guess the, the positive side is you do have four lanes of traffic, so we should be able to, for the vast majority of the time, keep traffic moving at least one way, one lane east, one lane west. It will just be opposite as to what uh, what was taking uh, place before. Uh, we have the uh, the bridge that was rebuilt that we will uh, funnel traffic on as we uh, work on the other aspect. Uh, notifying um, uh, motorists, whatnot. Yeah, we uh, we have a number of. Um, um, the mobile signs that we will look to put up, you know, before construction starts and while construction is on, uh, providing as much information as we can to motorists in that area. And sometimes we look to move away from that area to, to uh, provide uh, motorists with information as well. Excellent. That covers it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Turner. Thank you. And through you, Your Worship. Um, uh, Councillor Osanek answered or asked a lot of the questions that I was going to ask concerning this as a lot of my residents travel down this road. Um, one question though, I do have a lot of cyclists that use this uh, route to downtown. Uh, will they be accommodated in this? So um, in talking with Mr. Van Buren today, one of the signs that we are looking at, uh, or, or I shouldn't say one of the signs, some of the signage that we are looking at putting out is uh, the share of the road type of signage. Um, so we will uh, endeavor, yes, to accompany uh, cyclists. The, you know, I think with the, uh, the narrowing in, it will be um, maybe a bit more of a, a challenge than what it would normally be. And uh, um, actually, the last go around during construction cycle down the road myself. I, th I think it's something that you know cyclists need to be aware of. So I think it's going to be uh, more with signage and whatnot, uh, alerting motorists uh, you know to be cautious as opposed to um, you know providing the full width of a cycling lane which you have on the rest of the road. There, I think that will be a bit difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will call the vote on clause C. And that carries. Clause D, award of contract, construction of sidewalks, various locations. Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I read this and thought, oh, great. And I presume it is, but it doesn't say where the sidewalks are going. And sidewalks have been a real issue, say, a decade ago. Things are much improved. So I was wondering if you could not tell us now, I'm not expecting you to tell us now, but if you could send us something that says where these sidewalks are actually going in. Um, through you, Worship, the, the quick answer to that is yes, uh, we, uh, we can do that. Uh, they, there would have been some detail provided when we presented the four-year report to Council. Right. I, I realize that was some time ago. Um, and uh, yeah, we will uh, we'll make that information available uh, to Council. And there's, there's also avenues um, 
um, our website and whatnot, that we, w we will make this information available uh, to the public sort of as a whole. And then when we get into, uh, into areas more specifically as well. Thank you. Okay, we will call the vote on Clause D. And that carries. Clause F, receipt of the 2016 Water System Annual Compliance Reports. Councilor Sanic. Thank you, Your Worship. As I've read these reports over the last 10 years, I always focus on the number of bypass events. And it's great to see that for um, Raven's view, there's, there's been like a marked reduction in the number, um, like over the last four years anyway. Like this year, we've only had nine. Last year, we had 11. 2014, we had 40. And 2013, we had 24. So that's excellent. I know that last year, we had a drought and didn't have a lot of rain that could have contributed to the bypass events. Do you think that last year's of just having nine events was mostly due to you know the good fortune of weather being on our side? or? Um, has Utilities Kingston been doing um, a lot of improvements over the last couple of years that have contributed to the reduction in bypass events, you know, compared to four years ago when we had 40 or 24 with the rainfalls? Mr. Keach. Through your worship, um, again, the, um, I'll, I'll give a quick answer, then I'll elaborate. The quick answer is, is actually both. Um, it is the weather, and I think that's something that I always try to stress, that you can work and work and work and then have heavy rainfalls or you know a lot of snow and heavy, heavy snow melts, and it make it look like you actually haven't accomplished anything. So it is a combination of the two. So uh, um, yeah, I think we're um, all well aware of uh, um, the limited amount of rain that we had during uh, last year, so, so that helped. Uh, but saying that, we have done and continue to do a significant amount of work you know, to eliminate bypasses, either be it from um, road construction projects um, where we uh, work to remove the combined sewer and replace them with, uh, with the two separate sewers. A very good example of that last year was the, uh, the Princess Street project. Um, and I think people have heard us talk about uh, the stone box combined sewer there that's well over 100 years old and um, every um, um, every year that we work on that we, we, we do notice um, some success uh, along with a number of other projects uh, that we, uh, we work on. Um, there's a number of things and I'm just going to take a second here to elaborate on this that we do continue to work on and one of the drawbacks that we have sometimes is that we've improved on our monitoring and reporting abilities. So it's not just the plants or the big combined sewage overflow tanks, but the, uh, the smaller um, uh, pieces of infrastructure where on a, uh, on a street we will, uh, we will have um, it, it designed that if the rainfall gets to a certain level, it will um, overflow um, in, in sort of a small way compared to the others. We've worked with the Ministry of Environment for a number of years to put monitoring equipment at a lot of those locations. And um, we're actually, um, I think when we meet with uh, council at the shareholders meeting, we're going to show you a very unique uh, technology that we've come up with to be able to report on basically all the ones that we have um, in a much more timely manner. So that is good. That is excellent because we're going to be providing more information, more timely information to you and the public. That is bad because we're going to be providing more information on bypasses and we will be showing those. So you, even though we're doing work, you may actually, uh, you may actually uh, see it go up. But uh, um, again, uh, a lot of work, a lot of progress being made. And you know, I've been asked the question, when will we get to the point that this is all done? And I, I think I've said years ago, I, I'm not sure we'll ever see it happen. I, I will not see it in my career, but if you start to look at the maps and whatnot, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and I think down the road, uh, you're never going to get to where it's 100% eliminated, but it's going to get to where there are very few of these. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm not sure whether you answered uh, my question while answering <laughs> Councilor Sanic. So I just, one of the questions I, I was interested in was, uh, it says under the executive summary that operational staff will continue to improve the operation of Raven's use and using its state-of-art technology and so on. And I just wondered 
if what those improvements were intended to be. And uh, you did mention a couple of things there. But I'm not sure it answers that question. So I thought I'd give you an opportunity to elucidate um, that. Through your worship, um, uh, Mr. Kevin Riley manages the um, water and wastewater operations and collections at, at Utilities Kingston. And um, I, uh, without digging into the reports, I, I think uh, you're talking about some of the optimization of the process that we work that we're doing at Ravensview. It's something that we uh, we continue to uh, look towards with all the plants. Um, um, and again, since you asked me the question, I'm going to put a plug in. We are currently in the process of rebuilding the West Sewage Treatment Plant. Um, work is underway. It's a uh, it's a three-year project. Uh, it will lead to a, um, um, a a better process, so the effluent that goes back out into the waterway will be improved. Also, a significant improvement in hydraulic capacity that's allowing us to uh, be prepared for development. And uh, you know, the recent industry that's been announced coming to Kingston. I think having the foresight to do the work on this facility has uh, has helped us uh, significantly in that regards. But um, you know, more specifically, just tweaking of the process so um, it's um, um, you know the what, what we're putting back out into the environment is more environmental and friendly or less harmful than what it would have been in the past. Thank you. One other question. It indicated I didn't realize this. Maybe I should have, but I didn't that they were, were providing research opportunities to local universities. I was just wondering if you could tell us what kind of opportunities those were. Uh, through you, Your Worship. We're looking at partnering with universities such as RMC and Queen's University uh, on optimization of the gas production uh, as part of our biosolids handling at the wastewater treatment plants. So basically that's utilizing the methane gas uh, for electricity production and um, using other technologies to enhance the digestion process. That's just one research project that we are getting involved with with universities. Uh, we're looking for other partnerships with, uh, with Queens and other universities uh, to further optimize the wastewater treatment processes using new technologies that are coming uh, out right now. So, uh, did I read that you're already doing some of that? We've had some uh, research projects going on with uh, some of the grad students at Queens Universities for, for a number of years now. Uh, towards their master's programs and things like that. Uh, we're getting a little bit more serious into it right now, uh, looking at programs and contacting universities to see if they can help us optimize our processes. So we're, we're at, the, at the beginning phases of, of that type of work. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say that I remember then when the Walkerton contamination inquiry was going on, there was severe criticism of the council of the day for not asking the right questions. And so I always, when this comes up, I always try to remember that. And I want to thank uh, Councillor Sanic, who has doggedly asked at least some of those questions over the last, uh, uh, the years that I've served with her anyway. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So we will call the vote on Clause F. And that carries. Clause G, Site Plan Control Securities Policy and Procedures Review. Councillor Sanic. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have one question to staff, and that's about the um, cap on the on-site security amount. So what we have today before these changes is 50% on-site um, cost of works, right? And 100% off-site. And what we're proposing is still 50% and 100%, and it says in our report that in the past, sometimes we've had situations where the amount has not been sufficient of on-site to cover the cost of identified deficiencies, and we're only keeping like 55 to $75,000 um, in securities on average. So now that we're gonna be imposing a cap where we didn't have a cap before, I don't see how that's benefiting the city to make sure that we still have enough money to cover all the on-site um, landscaping and the other elements of on-site cost of works. I just want that explained better, please. Ms. Agnew. 
Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. So when we undertook this work, we looked at not only best practices from other municipalities, but we also looked at, um, historically speaking, what the city has experienced in the last 20 or 25 years um, from a site plan security's perspective. So I believe there was one, maybe two occasions in the last 20 years or so where we actually had to recall securities on a project because there was a default situation. So it's, it's not something that happens very often. We also have other mechanisms um, besides Besides just the amount that we hold to the securities through the Municipal Act to add things to people's tax roll that can, um, we have those mechanism, mechanisms in place. So for example, there was um, a situation where we didn't have sufficient securities to cover off, which was required uh, work that would need to be undertaken. We would have other mechanisms as a municipality to recover that fully from the property owner, the, the corporation that owns the property. So right now, we're going to be um, doing um, 250000 um capped amount, and that's to benefit the applicants, right? So for the on-site, if 50% um, of the on-site should say be $350,000, we are doing a cap of 250000 and that could help the applicants. But if it still, you know, has deficiencies, that's where we could go into the Municipal Act and try to get... Uh, the money over that 250 still covered. Commissioner Hurdle. Through, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the, the, I would just like to add to the first uh, question and, and answer that the report doesn't, the report indicates that we actually had to draw from the site plan control securities. It doesn't say we didn't have necessarily enough money in terms of the site plan securities, but we actually had to draw from them. So we would continue to do that. So putting a cap doesn't um, stop us from doing that. And um, and I, I um, in terms of the second question, yes, the $250,000 uh, $250, is an amount that we're trying to implement to help with some of the larger projects. And we have some of them, uh, for example, in our industrial areas or employment lands where they're not necessarily um, you know, residential developments, but when you look at uh, the costs that would be associated with them, they would be pretty significant. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Neal. Just very quickly, um, I know that we have a very ambitious uh, uh, urban forest plan, um, and I just wanted to make the comment that site plan is always an appropriate opportunity for us uh, to get some of those plantings taking place, and I look forward to, through the site plan process, uh, staff being able to help us with our targets for for reforesting the 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 city so thank you so we will call the vote on clause g and that carries report number 33 from the cao Moved by Councillor Holland, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that report number 33 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. I think clause one is, <clears throat> excuse me, renovation of Breakwater Park, Community Infrastructure Program, and Lake Ontario Waterkeeper Grant Awards. Councillor Stroud. So I saw Councillor Stroud first. Okay. Um, thank you, Your Worship. This park is in my district, and I know... Um, that it, it, it's a project where the timeline far precedes my time on council. And uh, I actually heard from um, a councillor from a few terms ago ask me a question. So I'm gonna ask it now on behalf of my constituents. She's a, one of my constituents now. She formerly was a councillor. Uh, she asks, uh, what is going to happen with the bike paths? Uh, it wasn't clear from the report uh, how that how, how the bike path is going to be in the design. Mr. Falwell. 
through your worship, um, if the council is referring to the path that is a linear path along the south side of King Street, then that will be retained. That will be a four meter wide concrete pathway. There will be a number of secondary pathways through the park that range from two meters to three meters as well. So uh, follow up on that. So the, the secondary pathways will be parallel to that, to King Street, or they're just being, in, will they come in and out, or how does that work? Through your worship, uh, there'll be connections from King Street. The main pathway that is currently asphalt now and is just south of the trees will be that four meter wide multi-use pathway that runs from the water treatment plant down to the Queen's heating plant in the similar location that it's in now. So it'll, it'll be a multi-use pathway that four meters wide, which is one meter wider than the KMP trail, I believe. Is that correct? Through your worship, uh, generally speaking, yes, the KMP trail does range in its width uh, that's been recently approved by council from about two and a half meters to three meters. Um, we, uh, the path width in Breakwater Park is wider because of the uh, anticipated intense use that we know the park sees now and it will see once the uh, completion of the project is. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's clear that there will be uh, bicycle, quite a bit of bicycle traffic along there as well as heavy uh, pedestrian traffic and probably even more than we see now once, it's, once it, the project is complete. I think we're hoping to see a lot of use at this park uh, beyond which, what, what is already there. So I think I can speak for the majority of the constituents of Sydenham that we're looking forward to the completion of this project. Delighted that it's coming forward in timeline uh, because I think the mayor has already said publicly that um, <clears throat> this might not have happened during this term of council had it, had it not been for these two grants. I think the grant information speaks for itself. I do have one, a different aspect of a, a question along a different aspect to ask, just as a formality. Um, the last time this project uh, came to council, it had a different price tag, a lower price tag. And I'm wondering uh, uh, if we can get a, a simplified version for the public of w why uh, the extra, I think 1.2 uh, million in the difference in the price tag between the last time we saw this project and what we see today. Mr. Falwell. Through your worship. So the first time council saw this project was in 2013 when we completed the master plan, the detailed design, and that was at $4.2 million. The next time council saw this project was at the waterfront master plan and the, the cost was at $4.9 million. So between those three years, that was an escalation factor of about 5%, which is something that we have done through our general park and capital projects planning um, and with assistance from our financial department. And since the 2016 waterfront master plan was adopted, this project was forecasted in 2018. So between in, uh, what has taken place, there's that additional escalation from the 2016 to the 2018, but the compressed timeline, and we have uh, indicated some additional resources in order to complete this project uh, within the granting requirements over the next year. Thank you. So is any of that uh, extra cost due to uh, financing cost? Uh, Ms. Kennedy. Through your worship, um, no, there would be no other financing costs included in that. So we have said that uh, we would be issuing debt up to $2.5 million. Um, we had initially projected for about $4 million in debt, but with the extra external funding coming in, we've been able to bring that down. However, because of the change in timing, um, there may be some ability to take less debt and do more as pay as you go, just depending on the timing of some of the other projects. Great. Well, in conclusion then, I'd like to say that I fully support this uh, recommendation and uh, I, I believe I speak for the residents of Sydenham who are excited to see this come, come forward like this, uh, excited to have the grants to make it possible and uh, I, I'd just like to wish staff, staff good luck with this large and important project. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes, thank you. Um, I totally support this. It's an excellent report. It's good that we're able to, to kind of bump it up. Um, it, I just want to remind people that it was one of those targeted uh, pr uh, priorities of, of the current council, and I do believe it was one of the mayor's uh, election platforms. So it's good that, that we're achieving this sooner rather than later. I will just 
I always feel like I'm old father time, the history on this council. But the reality is in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we had very popular public beaches that the city of the day, at the, of the day had to abandon because of the number of, uh, of days when the beaches were closed due to, uh, due to our decaying infrastructure. And it's a credit to, uh, I think it's a credit to uh, the work that we've done on infrastructure in the last 20 years that it's something that we can at least start to reconsider in the future. And I, I know for, for a fact, uh, when my kids were growing up, being able to use Richardson Beach uh, was a huge uh, pleasure for everybody living in the core of the city. So, so I applaud our staff for uh, being able to clean up uh, the water by renewing and revitalizing our, our infrastructure, so. Thank you, Councillor Turner. Okay, thank you, through you, Your Worship. Um, I am so excited to see this come through to Council and I'm, I'm ecstatic that we have two grants coming in. I sat on the Waterfront Committee, so this is excellent news. I just have two quick questions about it um, that I received from some uh, constituents. One was about the kiteboarding, if that will still be allowed in the park, and another was about the sandy beach and how that will be maintained. If you could answer those two questions, that would be great. Thank you. Mr. Falwell. Through your worship, uh, the kiteboarding community was involved in the original 2013 master plan um, and, and detailed design that was completed, and we've removed some of the obstructions to allow them to continue, and that's certainly our intention, to allow the kiteboarding activity that takes place there to, uh, to take place, and we'll be sure to uh, continue to reach out to them as we get into the construction to ensure that there aren't any sharp edges and obstructions that would uh, uh, cause them to have concerns about this project. Uh, regarding the sand beach components, uh, I can't specifically speak in terms of the maintenance. I'd have to look at our public works team um, and, and ask for some additional information. I'd be happy to follow up with council if that would be okay. We do have a similar upland beach at Lake Ontario Park as well. So we do have experience in, in this type of infrastructure. I know through our beach volleyball courts and other sand type of amenities, they are tilling and, and maintaining them on a regular basis. So I'd expect that to continue. Thank you very much. Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll just add on to another question about the sand beach. I love the idea of a sandy beach, um, all for a sandy beach in this limestone city. And so I just wondered, um, it's going to be on top of the concrete platform dock that we have there, right? It won't be right on shore. So um, will it be really deep sand, and will there be um, a rubber, you know, um, base between the sand and the concrete so that if you are playing volleyball or just diving into the sand, wrestling, something like that, you're not going to have your knees scraped if you go through the sand to the bottom. That's it's just safety is what I was asking about. Through your worship, um, the, the sand beach itself is actually to the east of the water treatment plant. It's not out on the pier, so it's in a current grass area, and it will be designed to the safety standards to ensure that the, the concerns you've raised aren't, aren't uh, a problem. So the sand does actually come right to the waves, like to the shoreline? I thought we had seen an earlier report a few years ago that the wave action would sweep out all the sand and we wouldn't be allowed to have a type of sandy beach um, in Breakwater Park. Through your worship, just a point of clarification, it is an upland beach, it is not in the wave action. Um, it, we've certainly not promoting sand uh, within the current uh, uh, jetties that are there. So it will be upland just like the Lake Ontario Park one and it won't be in direct contact with the water or the waves. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison. So, no boulders on this breakwater beach uh, park, unlike Richardson, which just needs one good storm to get boulders, and you have to take them out. 
Is that, is that what I heard you say? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't think so. No, he was talking about sand and whether we could maintain the sandy beach, okay? And he was saying that they have experience and can do that. But at Richardson Beach, the continual churn of boulders comes in there. So, at any rate, no? So, I'm just wondering if. So, I think that Mr. Volwell just said that it's not going to be in contact with the water. So, that's going to solve that okay. problem. So we will still have to deal with Sorry, that. Sorry to speak for you, Mr. Follow, but okay. that was correct. Okay, I misunderstood that. That's okay. So um, will we have to deal with the boulders and all that sort of thing in this location? Or is it outside of the, far enough outside the current? Mr. Follow? So there's an upland beach that will not be in contact with the water. There are a number of areas where there will be rocks and improvements to the shoreline that will allow the public to access the water those will be pebbles, those will be boulders, those will be of various sizes from the water treatment plant to the heating plant. We are improving the access to the public to the water in various locations. Those rocks will move over time. Fair enough. So um, I, first of all, I wanted to say that I too am really happy to see this, especially the way the considerable amount of work that staff has done to make this uh, collaboration come together with the city, the federal government, and um, uh, Lake Ontario water keepers. Um, I just had one question. Um, it's clear why Breakwater Park is being up, um, increased in priority because of the opportunities here and the sizes. It's all well outlined why this was done, and I'm supportive of that. So I'm just wondering what has this done to the priority of the rehabilitation of Riches and Beach? Mr. Rollo? Through your worship, uh, staff are not recommending any changes to the waterfront master plan priority that's currently in place. We do have um, on our 2017 capital uh, project list, Richardson Beach bathhouse improvements for this year, and those will be continuing, and we are not recommending any change into future waterfront master plan initiatives. They will follow as approved by council. Um, so that happens this year, and then is there anything that follows that? It's been a while since I've looked at the waterfront park. The waterfront through, through your worship, I, I don't have the plan. detailed list of the waterfront projects with me, but I'd be happy to circulate that to council in terms of an update of, of where Richardson Beach uh, itself falls, but that's definitely within the next five years. Great. Thank you. Okay, so we will call the vote on Clause 1. And that carries. Clause two, award of contract, architectural lights, city hall, Springer Market Square, and Confederation Park Fountain. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, a couple questions first uh, to staff through you. Um, so the report talks about an increase, the, the difference in the budget of the amount requested for this project um, talks about the need to increase not only the quality of the lighting, that part I understood because it refers to wireless um, receivers, but also the quantity, and I was wondering why that was, why that change was required. Mr. Canellis. Through you, Your Worship. Uh, when this project originally started, um, we were going to replace uh, like for like. There was 32 lights. Uh, there were floodlights. We were going to replace them with 32 LED floodlights. Uh, upon retaining our um, consultants, uh, in order to highlight uh, the significant architectural features on the building, they determined that we needed an additional 25 lights and also to upgrade them from um, like LED floodlights that we were intending to architectural um, high output um, architectural lights that would better um, highlight uh, the architectural features of this uh, building. Okay, thanks. Um, so another thing that comes to mind, so when we originally discussed this, we talked about that, that type of illumination of City Hall for commemorative uh, reasons, but also the fountain, I see. Um, I'm curious as to how much event uh, activity this would facilitate in Market Square, or whether that's whether these lights are, are 
for the sesquicentennial, for example, will this support proposed events in Market Square, or is this simply the illumination of the fountain in City Hall? As for your worship, uh, there is a component of um, lighting a Market Square, and that's where uh, five of the seven projectors would also be to, uh, based on the programming that culture and rec and leisure require uh, with respect to the uh, square, um, it would help accommodate future programming. Okay, thanks. Um, and when this originally came to us, I was not in favor at the original price. I am. I don't see the value here. Um, I won't be supporting this. It. It's interesting to see that there there is a. Um, the actual illumination policy will be part of commemoration policy and coming forward. And I think that's great. But I. Ultimately, I. I don't know that there is enough rationale for illumination to warrant a policy and this type of expenditure, so I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I will, and I do recognize you. Thank you, just a, a, couple, of, a couple of comments. Um, reflecting back on the previous debate we had about this. So, the lighting at City Hall needs to be replaced anyways. It's well past its life cycle, and we're gonna have to bite the bullet and replace that lighting. Why not do it now in time for the sesquicentennial celebrations for, for Canada Day? So that's certainly one way I would look at that. The second thing is that since we approved this, the response from our tourism and community partners has been tremendous. There are a number of people that have told me how excited they are uh, not only about the illumination of City Hall, but how it's going to <clears throat> add to the usability of space in and around City Hall and in Market Square, particularly in the evening, where right now this premier public space that we have is really only available in the daytime. So I think just a couple of points just to throw out there. Obviously, um, I too was struck with the increase in cost. Uh, however, uh, the way that I read this, we're not actually going to be spending more money, we're going to be taking money from other sources and other priorities. And this, this happens, right? With different projects, when something goes over budget, then we have to say, well, if we're gonna spend more on this, we have to spend less on other things. So that's the way I read this. So if this is a priority, basically what we're saying is that some of these other things listed in the recommendation are not priorities, so we're just reallocating those dollars. So for that reasons, that gives me comfort in terms of being fiscally responsible. We're not going to be spending any more money than we had originally intended. It's just gonna be drawn from other sources. So for that reason, I certainly hope that uh, Council will approve it. Thank you. If, uh, if I could have the chair back, Deputy Mayor, thank you. You sure may. Thank you. Anybody else wishes to speak? Councilor Turner. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Um, I support this motion. I think, it's, I think it's great for tourism. I think it's great to develop the downtown core and to bring more people into the city. Uh, look at the uh, HIP concert we had downtown and how many people we brought in in that occasion. This would just help in having more events downtown, and I think it would be beneficial to the city and tourism. So in this case, I support it. Thank you. Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. As chair of the Heritage Committee, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a question about the last uh, reallocation in the list. It says program 96390, 99,000 reallocated from Heritage Capital Envelope. I'm wondering what uh, impact that will have on, the, uh, on the, the things that get funding from that envelope. Mr. Canellis. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, none right now. That envelope, every year we allocate for emergencies that might, might come up or uh, needs that weren't uh, uh, planned or foreseen. Uh, so right now, uh, we identified that uh, we can use this money for this project. So theoretically, if um, City Hall needed some emergency renovations, for example, that, that would be the envelope that we would go to? Yes, but there is uh, some more money in that envelope too. Okay, so we're, we're taking a bit of spare cash from that envelope uh, because we have money available. Essentially. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bowman. 
Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I just want to add my support to this. Uh, I know we get a lot of requests to light up City Hall certain colors and everything for a bunch of different events, and we currently don't really have the capacity to meet that. And I'm also of the understanding that this is going to actually enhance the lighting system, not just kind of replace it like for like, which will also bring a lot of benefits such as, you know, LED lighting and, and all the benefits that come along with that. So, so for this is, yes, there's obviously an upfront cost, but we were going to have to replace it anyway, so it kind of ties all that together. So I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. So we will call the vote on Clause 2. And that carries by a vote of 10 to 2. Report number 34 from Planning Committee. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. It's my pleasure to present report number 34 from the Planning Committee for Council's consideration. <coughs> Thank you. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that report number 34 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. So there are two clauses. Uh, would anyone like them separated? Councillor Stroud, yes? Okay, okay, so we will set, we'll deal with them individually. So clause A is the official plan update comprehensive report. Councillor Stroud? Well, first, a procedural question. Uh, there's more than one uh, change that's being proposed. Uh, are we voting on all of them as one item currently? Because it's in one clause, right? So, we are voting on everything as a whole. That being said, you can separate, ask for separate votes on particular items if... Okay, I guess I'll ask that uh, item B be separated as it was the subject of the delegation and then we can uh, record the votes separately that way and deal with them separately. So item B of item A, I guess, A, A okay. slash B. Okay, thank you. Is now the time to speak to it or no? Yep. Okay. Uh, I think we need, uh, for uh, further clarification based on the concerns that were raised by uh, Ms. Sipnowich in the delegation, regarding the definition itself of large format retail, uh, because in the explanation I received from staff already, we all received, I believe, uh, it, uh, the point about Indigo Bookstore was, was brought up. Um, so I was wondering how, how would Indigo Bookstore or chapters or something of that nature, SNR, how would that uh, uh, compare with the definition that we're using in the official plan uh, for this clause? And also uh, things like uh, Loblaws or uh, Staples and other examples. Maybe if you just give a few examples that would be caught in the definition and, and things that would not to help the city, people of the city understand what, is, uh, what this change actually means. Mr. Dubin. Through you, Your Worship. The short answer to the question is that large format retail as introduced in the official plan is not a defined land use. It is, however, qualified in the policies that sit underneath the heading, heading large format retail, um, being a form of use that needs to be looked at with respect to its potential impact to the context within which it's proposed. So. The policy section itself is introduced in section 3-4-A of the official plan, which is the section that deals with the central business district or the city's downtown. And the issue of interest or concern here is what is the potential impact of introducing a traditional large format retailer in the downtown core? And so the policy is structured to say, and I'll just read it if, if I may, uh, large format retail uses are permitted, provided, that the built form is sensitive to the historic building fabric, scale, pedestrian amenity linkages with the lake, and protective view corridors. So this policy is being introduced uh, as a replacement to a current policy which prohibits large format retail. And the rationale for the introduction of this policy stems from the recommendations of the commercial lands review that the city and council um, recently supported. And, and the fundamental objective with all this, and I'm, I'm 
veering off a bit, but I hope it helps to address some other uh, questions or concerns. We are trying to bolster the strength of the city's downtown core. There are, the Commercial Lands Review identified a, a fairly high degree of vacancy and identified some of the policy constraints that might be um, best to address to help address the, the issue of vacancy. So if we can support a quote unquote large format retail, what I'll call a traditional large format retailer, the thing, the, the, the forms of development that people often refer, often refer to as a big box store, if we can support those businesses within a different form in the downtown core, that's what this policy is trying to, trying to achieve. So we may end up supporting a chapters, um, a winners, perhaps a reinvigoration uh, invigora of an SNR. Like these are the sorts of traditional big box that we want to bring to the city's downtown core, provided they can demonstrate compatibility with the built form. Okay, so just to further clarify, so the SNR that we used to have was a big box retail and is meant to be the kind of thing that you're suggesting we should allow, uh, or a winners or a, a chapters. Um, what about something like a Walmart or a Costco or a, um, a Rona or something of that nature? Through you, Your Worship. So I think a really important consideration in any of the policies in the official plan is you can't read them in isolation. So a Walmart, which may come with it a fairly large box, um, needs to be looked at against other policies of the plan, and I can refer um, council to a couple of those policies just in, in the interest of trying to demonstrate the point. So uh, there are policies that speak to demonstrating the potential impact on the, on the market viability of the downtown core. So if we had a proposal for a, mart, uh, a Walmart, a very large, say, single-story Walmart in the downtown core, which I think would cause a great deal of concern, there are a series of policy tests that this proposal would have to address. So would it have a detrimental impact on the market viability of the city's downtown core? Would it be in keeping with or compatible with the built form of the downtown? And I think many people would argue that a single story Walmart that, or, or any large format retailer, uh, if it took up a whole block of the downtown core, it would have a potentially negative impact on the functioning of the downtown, on the streetscape, on the pedestrian viability, and all these matters are considered within a variety of policies in the official plan. So I think it's really important that I know there's been some attention drawn to this specific policy because it's, it's new, but it has to be read in conjunction with the other policies that help us qualify whether or not a proposal is good planning or not. So I think what you're saying, if I can um, paraphrase it for the people listening, is that uh, through the analysis that was done, uh, it was identified that this uh, change would be compatible with the overall um, gist of our official plan, especially in the sense that it would encourage economic activity in the downtown, the viability of the downtown economic scene, and that there would still remain protection uh, or d we would be able to discern and uh, consider the impact of, uh, and, and, and uh, you would recommend against perhaps a type of large box retailer that would, of the large type that would take up a whole block, that would be incompatible for various reasons with planning guidelines that we have in place. Is that essentially what you're saying? Yes, for you, that's, uh, that's a fair summary. So then, I guess um, it remains to be de demonstrated, perhaps tonight uh, through this debate, and maybe my colleagues can help me. Uh, we need some of us might need convincing that the remaining, um, because it's not defined exactly what we mean by large format retail. It's not defined. You said that at the very beginning. Uh, we may, might need some convincing or some examples of how more than what you've just said how this would indeed be the case uh, in the context of other exceptions that we've made for uh, residential projects. I just, I don't know if you want to respond and if there's anything you can offer right now. Mr. Newman? Mr. You, Your Worship, I think the only thing I can suggest that we could do in, in the interest of, um, and I will speak to some of the other matters that Ms. Sipnowich um, presented, but in the interest of seeing this project proceed, 
one option that we have available to us is through the, uh, the zoning bylaw project, which is, is running concurrent with this official plan update, uh, would be to try and define this as a, as a use. And the reality is a large format retail store or use is a commercial use, no different than the corner store. So perhaps what we need to do in the zoning bylaw is put some quantifiers in behind this, this notion of a large format. And, and I think the better place to do that would be the zoning bylaw, which is intended to implement the broader vision of the official plan. Okay, that, that's a really good point. And, and I guess the only question that remains then, and this, you don't need to answer this, but our, um, because this is, this is the, we need to pass an official plan update at some point. And if we don't include this language, we close that door uh, that you've said we can further define through the zoning bylaw. And if we, uh, the only question that remains to me, and I'm not convinced yet, I don't know which way I'm gonna vote, and I'd like to hear from my colleagues, is, you know, are we, uh, getting this in the right order, and if, or, or do we perhaps need a timeout as was suggested by the delegation and to get input from the public about this kind of thing uh, before we go ahead and uh, open up uh, this, this aspect of the official plan to this type of thing. So uh, I, I think everyone knows what I'm saying. Uh, we need to, before we approve this, we need to make sure that uh, we've done our due diligence and that we are satisfied that protection remains in other forms as has been mentioned by staff. So I'd like to go to the rest of my colleagues to uh, try to get that question answered before we vote. Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you. And as and I've spoken to, to the planning staff about this, I'm still trying to get my head around what uh, large retail means. And I think it's being translated as potentially large box stores. And I'm puzzled why there are several good features that are set up as, as protections for the, the quality of the downtown, but there's no mention of parking. And first of all, I think large box stores, typically uh, you wouldn't have a traditional Walmart or or a large box store that could come downtown with the demand that they require for parking. Uh, but having said that, I was surprised that parking isn't one of those considerations. Will that be captured in the comprehensive zoning bylaw? Ms. Agnew. Thank you and through you. So from a, um, a policy hierarchy perspective, you're going to capture the, the parking requirement through the zoning bylaw. So certainly any type of contemplated commercial use that at a high level is supported in the official plan. When you go down and you look at the zoning, you have to determine whether it's a permitted use and then there's the performance standards associated with that that guide the built form that the use is, is, is located within. So something like parking considerations would be tied to that performance standard. So certainly the larger the floor plate of a store, our parking regulations right now are a certain number of parking spaces per square foot of, of commercial space. So the larger the commercial space, even if it's um, vertically stacked, is which you would see in, in a more typical downtown area as opposed to horizontally organized where you have smaller parcels, you're still going to have that parking requirement that would need to be fulfilled as, as making the, the argument that um, the land use that, you're, that you are proposing represents good land use planning and it fits into all of the considerations of the official plan and that it also meets with the intent of the zoning bylaw as well. Thank you. I've I've lived in the core of the city for 40 years now, I guess, and, I, and what residents really lament is the fact that we no longer have uh, department stores, whether it was Kresge or, or SNR, we no longer have in the downtown core a fully uh, stocked hardware store, for instance. And, uh, and a lot of people lamented the loss of Indigo. Uh, so I guess I, I'm troubled by the broad sweep of the, of the bylaw talking about what potentially could be large box, larger retail. 
but I'm troubled by the fact that you can't, unless you are really desperate and you go to a dollar store, uh, you can't buy hardware equipment uh, down, downtown. You have trouble buying a pair of socks downtown. Uh, so so that I think, although I'm, I have reservations about this, and I'm troubled by the lack of parking definition, but I'm looking forward to that being in the comprehensive bylaw. Uh, but in my mind, the, what we're most fearful of, the Walmarts or the large box store kind of things, I don't think would have a business plan that would work in the downtown. Uh, an Indigo and s &R and department stores counted on uh, pedestrian and transit uh, customers and some customers driving. But so uh, I'm, I'm prepared uh, to support this but to work very hard on the comprehensive zoning bylaw to make sure that uh, the greatest fears that, that people have about this can be addressed there. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor George. Thank you, Worship. I can remember many, many years ago that your SNR, your Woolworths, your Kruskies, your Vandervoorts, they were the big box stores of downtown. And I know Woolworths, you used to be able to go into Woolworths and uh, they had the uh, little lunch bar there, you could get a hot dog and a Coke for 25 cents. You can't do that anymore in the old box stores. <laughs> yeah, I hate to admit it. Um, I, I like where Councillor Stroud was going in, the, in his line of questioning in regards to making sure that with, with the current way the zoning bylaw has been written, that we can put some real meat to what we want to see through our zoning bylaw. And that's the way I've always understood the way the two work is that you create your zone, your OP as a guide for future development and then you take your zoning bylaw and that's where you put the real meat into it to really take control of the specific zoning to make sure that you can deal with the large box stores, you can deal with the parking and that sort of thing. Um, I, I did want to ask staff though, because, uh, and I appreciate the presentation we, we heard earlier this evening because it certainly brought uh, some questions up that uh, personally myself too, I, I'm hoping that maybe staff and I did hear uh, Mr. Newman allude to the fact that they are prepared to respond to some of those. I'm wondering through your worship if we could ask staff I think it would be beneficial for all of us uh, because I did see them taking notes if they could uh, respond to some of the uh, concerns that were brought to our attention through the delegation this evening. Mr. Newman. Thank you and to you, Your Worship. Uh, firstly, thank you to uh, Ms. Sipnowich for uh, offering the feedback tonight and throughout the course of this project, we have received a great deal of feedback from the public. Uh, this project has been ongoing since early 2015 it was really intended to be an update, a five-year update to the city's official plan, and it has undoubtedly grown into something a little grander than that. It's not a new official plan, uh, but there are 1,500 plus um, amendments proposed, so it is a fairly substantial uh, amendment. And the reason for that, in my view, is because we have done a considerable amount of public consultation, and we have taken in, into great consideration the hundreds if not thousands of submissions received over the past two years. So have we satisfied the requirements of the Planning Act is, is a very important question that's been raised. The answer is yes. Uh, back in February of last year, we had a special meeting of council. That is one of three required steps that we have to take in this process. We have had six statutory public open houses uh, largely following each iteration of the plan. So we introduce a draft of the plan, we have an open house to talk about that draft. We've had three statutory public meetings 
whereas the Planning Act says that you need to have at least one. We've had three. And in addition to all of that, we've had coffee chats on weekends, uh, activities geared to families on a Sunday, and, and numerous face-to-face -face interactions with, uh, with members of the public. So we have given the public a great deal of opportunity to be engaged in this project. One uh, underlying provision of the Planning Act that I know is causing a bit of discussion is there's something in the Act that says um, the public meeting that you have is for the purpose of discussing the current proposed plan. So when, it's, when we've presented these plans, it has been at the time the current proposed plan. So when we had the public meeting in November of this, of this past year, we were presenting a, what was referred to as the revised fifth draft. Uh, this revised fifth draft included the commercial lands, the recommendations of the commercial land study. So I think that's important to note because one of the, one of the policies that we just finished discussing is the uh, large format retail. That policy and several others were incorporated into the revised fifth draft and were followed by an open house and public meeting where we identified that the recommendations of the commercial lands review, which was supported by council, were being incorporated into the plan. And through that, the public had opportunity to, to familiarize themselves with these policies and to offer staff feedback. There's another component of the Planning Act that says, in giving your notice of adoption, so if council gets to a point tonight where they're willing and prepared to support the adoption of a bylaw that will give effect to the amendments, we are required to, in our notice of adoption, to identify, to provide a brief explanation of the effect of public input. So clearly there's an expectation under the Act that we are hearing things and we are making changes because the Act expects us to, to summarize the effect of, the, of the, the, the input that's been received and the effect is in the, in the revisions. So we've confirmed with our internal and external legal counsel that uh, we have in fact satisfied the requirements of the Act and we are excited to see the project continue. Ultimately, next steps, it goes to the province for review and approval. They have 180 days once we send them the package, so we are still a ways out uh, from being in a place of having an updated official plan. Um, yes, yeah, so there was another question about um, the changes coming out of Bill 73. So Smart Growth for Our Communities was a bill passed last year, and the changes uh, came into effect in June or July 1st of last year. So one of the changes was that we have to have policies that speak to uh, public consultation strategy and with uh, Planning Act applications, so rezoning, uh, minor variance, plans and subdivision, uh, we can request or require that someone provide a description of their public consultation strategy. Uh, that was one thing that we incorporated into the plan in the fifth draft, so in, ad in advance of a couple open houses and one public meeting. Um, in section 9.14 of the plan, or 9.12 of the plan. So we have policies that address the Bill 73 requirements uh, brought into the plan. We have been working very close with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Ministry of Housing Planners to ensure that we are in a good position when we submit this plan and that we are satisfying these Bill 73 requirements. So. Um, We've added those policies, they've been in there for more than a, a handful of months and, um, and we're also working municipally as, as all, you, all members of council know on a community engagement strategy that will add some more substance to the, to the plan I suspect um, moving forward. Ms. Agnew. Thank you, and through you, in addition to that, um, staff have also been concurrently working on a revised process and best pra practice research as it relates to um, public participation in the planning process specifically related to Planning Act applications. So that work has been ongoing for about the past six months or so. We're just in the process right now of finalizing the communication strategy on that. We're gearing up to have some community focus groups early in the spring on that to review what we've determined to be uh, best practice across the province as it relates to things like having um, oral submissions at the time where the 
the planning committee is considering a comprehensive report. So those types of pieces of feedback that we've received through this process and through members of council, we're running with a concurrent process as well that again is going to go through some additional public consultation. Then we'll be bringing some formal recommendations on that um, later in the spring back to planning committee for consideration. And certainly coming out of that, there will likely be some potential additional amendments, not only to maybe the, the committee's procedural bylaw, but there's additional things that may need to be considered in respect of the official plan as well, depending on where we end up making some recommendations to make sure that all the policies in section nine that we have in there now are enhanced and, and really um, consistent with um, what um, we're gonna be recommending for the, the planning process and the public involvement in that going forward. So that work is also concurrently being undertaken. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that very much. And I hope it was informative for others as well. And I much like Councillor Neal, I look forward to supporting this um, with obviously the intent that when we get down to the zoning bylaws that uh, that will give us the opportunity to to really delve a little deeper into the concerns uh, that are brought to our attention and uh, and work with the community uh, on making sure that uh, height restrictions and parking allocation and all of those other uh, uh, details are, are dealt with appropriately. So thank you very much for all the work you've done over the past few years. Thank you, Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Worship. Um, I have a question regarding that's more related to what the specifics of the of the wording of the large format retail uses. I indicated to staff that I would ask a question along this line. My my, we've asked about different forms of building, and the the form of building that I'm most concerned with is occurred in a proposal that came forward in the early '80s about having a. I don't know the technical term for it, but the shops are inside one structure. And sometimes you have to go down to get to them, but you have to go off the street. So there really is no streetscape. It's like the Eaton Center. In, uh, or, and they've done it in other cities. They did in Hamilton, and it really devastated their downtown. There was no street life whatsoever, really. And I was there when that was after that happened and it was pretty demonstrable. In London they did the same thing, it's a bit of a disaster. Anyway, a lot of people organized and, and stopped that in Kingston 30 odd years ago. And um, I think we would all probably agree that we dodged a bullet there. We have a vital downtown that is very pedestrian friendly and encourages interaction and engagement and we're the better and off for it. So. In looking at this, um, it says that the built form is compatible with, and it lists some important indications here. I'm wondering, and I know part of the general answer, I'm looking for that, you know, that uh, I'm wondering if that kind of development that, uh, that I just described, and if you have the technical term, I appreciate that. The, um, is how that's prevented by the official plan. And some of it's repetitive of what you said, but I think you should repeat it. And what spe more specifically would prevent that? And insofar as in a specific way, for instance, it doesn't say anything about streetscape here. Or now perhaps that's covered in other parts of the plan. And if so, I think the public should know about that. Mr. Newman. Through you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you for the question. So I think the, the concern is what would prevent or, or hinder the uh, establishment of a, a, a very large, perhaps a full block, in, fully enclosed mall, essentially downtown, where you've turned your back to the street and the majority of activity occurs off the downtown strip and outside of the public realm. And so there are a series of policies uh, under section 3411, um, <clears throat> if you want a specific reference, it's under the header market justification and impact assessment. Sub C speaks to um, looking at the way that a proposal will maintain the planned function of existing sites um, in the retail hierarchy. 
So very clearly, if we get a proposal for something that, that is dramatically different from uh, the, the planned function of the downtown, then this policy gives us a bit of a, an avenue to have a conversation about appropriateness. But more importantly than me now cherry picking a couple policies that support my response, we have a whole section of the official plan, section 10A, which is the downtown and harbour area special policy area. <clears throat> so this section of the plan has quite a number of policies that define what the expectation is for the function of the city's downtown core. So that there is an animated streetscape and there is a mix of uses within, within wholly enclosed buildings, that, that there's mandatory ground floor commercial, that there's prime pedestrian streets. So Princess Street is a prime pedestrian street as is uh, portions of Queen Street. So there is a very clear expectation in this plan of, of how the downtown or the central business district is to operate and, and is to function and what it's to look like and how it's to support the character that it is defined by today. Yeah, I guess the other important thing to add is if we had this larger scale retail proposal that had the potential to compromise the function of the city's downtown core, had the, comp uh, the, the potential to undermine the, uh, the viability of the independent shops downtown, there is an opportunity for the city to require a market assessment and a justification for a large format retailer to, to try and occupy the city's downtown. And there's also, as, as you all know, an opportunity to require a peer review of whatever would be submitted by a proponent. Thank you for that. They, so, like the downtown uh, and harbor area architectural guidelines, do they have the... I suppose you would, I take it you would argue that in conjunction with other considerations, they would have the weight to, I think the word was hinder, the type of development, I, like mall development I was talking about, or big box development that other councillors were referring to. And um, I guess the problem for the public, perhaps, is that it doesn't tell us that it will be stopped. <laughs> and so when you have a prohibition, is it not arguable? I'm not saying it's true, I'm asking you. Is it not arguable that having a prohibition would be a higher fence for them to for such a proposal to jump. Mr. Newman. Through you, Your Worship. It's a good question, because right now the plan says that large format retail is prohibited in the central business district. So if we had an application tomorrow for a large format retailer seeking to occupy the city's downtown, and provided we could get to a position of saying that, yes, that is a large format retailer, then the requirement would be to amend the official plan to establish whatever was being proposed as a permitted use. I, I would argue today that allowing it to be contemplated without an official plan amendment as proposed would allow for us to give consideration to any form of, of large format retailer, provided the substantial tests of the plan are, are satisfied so I, I guess I think there's a hindrance, and I think our consultants doing the commercial lands review agreed there's a hindrance to putting unnecessary process in front of a, a potential proposal that had the, uh, the ability to um, add vitality to the city's downtown core when you get to a position of addressing all other policies in the plan. So the objective here is to not establish a policy framework that adds unnecessary constraint to things that are able to demonstrate against the tests of the policy that they're, they're appropriate. Are, are you, in a sense, arguing that, um, that a prohibition actually is, if you want to not have those types of developments, right? Or of that size, let's say. Um, you're actually, with a prohibition, you're actually um, creating a gap or a greater possibility 
that it could be argued against having those developments? I mean, I think you're saying what I, what I, I think partly what you said, you didn't say that, okay, I'm not trying to suggest you were, but I think what you're say, saying is that, um, that there are risks on both sides if you have a prohibition or if you have um, a defined um, set of conditions. Mr. Newman. Through you, Your Worship, uh, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that right now we have established a prohibition against something that, on the face of the, the details of a proposal, might make a lot of sense. So the recommendations of the Commercial Land Review were that we should seek out opportunities to help um, strengthen the city's downtown core, and one opportunity is to avoid a blanket prohibition against the type of use that may actually be very uh, compatible with the city's downtown. So we have a really strong framework for doing the assessment of compatibility and appropriateness, so we don't need the prohibition which applies a blanket restriction against something that might be very appropriate. One, one last question. <clears throat> I think one of the biggest issues downtown that comes up quite often, it, it, certainly since I've been on council, is the, the need is, uh, for a grocery store. And we don't know if the food basics will last. So my understanding is it being said, but I wasn't there to hear this. So I want to, I'm asking you, would this wording allow for the establishment or reestablishment of, of a grocery store downtown? And is that part of the motive for this wording? Ms. Agnew. Thank you, and through you, so as part of the commercial land strategy, the consultants that we hired provided an assessment that told us that we had a gap. So the policy goal for the CBD says to provide the broadest range of commercial activity that's suitable for the central business district. And it also gives a sense of priority to, um, to services, to clothing, to things like um, medical care and access to food. So we wanted to ensure that in trying to achieve the intent of the goal of the central business district, which is the, the policy framework that guides the downtown, that we weren't having a prohibition on a certain type of commercial use that's subject to um, compatibility and all the considerations that are laid out in section three and section 10 that we're undermining the spirit and the intent of the overall goal of the CBD and that we're somehow compromising the level of commercial service that we're providing to this area and given its planned function for the city as a growth area, as an area of an intensification, as an area where we've put substantial um, money behind our transit and we want to see additional people come, we need to ensure that we're supporting the overall plan function of the area and achieving that while taking into consideration all the compatibility tests that the built form would have to look like to make that use work in the downtown and the market consideration tests that they'd have to demonstrate as part of the application process. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I just want to add to, to the questions around the grocery store. The large retail format would enable um, for a grocery store. And I know that's been a question that's been asked, especially in the downtown, so that the wording that we have would enable the uh, the establishment of a grocery store as long as they meet, obviously, all of the policy tests that are within the official plan. So, Councillor Hutchison, you're out of time. So uh, I'll move on, if that's uh, okay. So next on my list is Councillor Shell. Uh, thank you, Mayor Patterson. I think the latest uh, building downtown right now that I think would fit everything you're talking about is the Scotia Bank that is just being constructed. So could you sort of relate that construction to what you are talking about in the large format retail uses are permitted provided that um, uh, in terms of compatibility and all that sort of thing. I'm presuming that's exactly the sort of thing that you are leading toward and that that would be coming in the zoning bylaw as well. Could you sort of describe that, please? Yes, through you, Your Worship. So, uh, again, official plan, we're working at a higher level, but some of the primary objectives of the plan in the, in the city's downtown uh, and the policy framework expressed in Section 10A speak to the, the pedestrian streetscape. 
So I'm not sure how many members of council have had the opportunity to walk past that Scotia Bank that's under construction now, but there is a lot of um, glass along the streetscape and the building orientation itself is to the street. So the, ac the access to the proposed, or to the, the Scotia Bank is from Princess Street and from the flanking street as well, I believe. So there, there is a policy framework in Section 10A that does uh, prioritize and give emphasis to the design of buildings that provide connections to the streetscape that don't compromise the plan function. A compromise to the plan function would be a building that puts its back to Princess Street and has, has no access to Princess Street and fronts on to perhaps Queen with its back to Princess. So there are, there's a very clear policy framework that would allow city staff to say no to that sort of proposal. Thank you. And uh, for me, of course, it was that the historic building fabric, the building was removed but has been replaced with um, the look of the historic building that was there. Um, and the scale is compatible with the rest of the street. The actual streetscape and height is, is very similar. While we now have a very large new um, commercial establishment that I think would fit under this large format, uh, now commercial, but you talked about the commercial review. Um, so I I did, when I first saw that, I thought the same thing, because I was here in the 80s too, with that uh, huge proposal for a shopping mall. Um, but I can, I'm quite content that this is not what we're talking about in this. Um, and um, I can certainly support uh, Item B, in, including the entire official plan update. Um, I would like to agree with commending staff because we have been through multitudes of meetings um, and uh, huge reports with uh, all public comments uh, written down for us and, and the comments and explanations as to why or why not these uh, items were included in the official plan update. I think it's been an incredibly comprehensive uh, series of uh, meetings that we've been through. Um, and it has sort of begun much of the open government that we've been talking about with the uh, public framework, public policy framework that's coming up. Um, so that we, as we work our way through this openness that we really have begun in a very big way, does mean that we're getting a lot more public comment. And so long as we understand it and uh, incorporate it when it's appropriate, which very often it is. Uh, it's, it's quite a new time that we've entered and uh, can be a little uh, frustrating for some people at times and very exciting at times too. So I'd like to thank staff and, and all of us for this whole change that uh, has begun. So I will certainly be supporting this and again, thanks very much. Thank you. So we will call the vote then on Clause A. Uh, Councillor Stroud, did you still want that subclause separated? Yes, please. So what we will do is we will first <clears throat> call the vote on everything except for subclause B. Please vote. And that carries. Now the vote on subclause B. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of 10 to 1. Clause B, approval of an application for zoning bylaw amendment 1213 and 1219 Princess Street. We'll call the vote. And that carries. Report number 35 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee. Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you. It's my pleasure to present report number 35 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee. Duly moved and seconded.
Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Holland, that report number 35 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee be received and adopted. So there's just the one clause, a proposal to establish a Mayor's Arts Award program as recommended in the Kingston Culture Plan. We will call the vote. And that carries. Report number 36 from the Nominations Committee. Thank you, Your Worship. It gives me pleasure to rise and uh, report to present report number 36 from the Nominations Committee, duly moved and seconded. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Boehm, seconded by Councillor Hutchison, that report number 36 from the Nominations Advisory Committee be received and adopted. So there's just the one clause with respect to the Tourism Kingston Board of Directors. It says that the following appointments be made to the Tourism Kingston Board of Directors for a term of one year expiring on December 31st, 2017. Bill Durnford, Maria Batista, Brett Christopher, Lindsay Fair, Paul Fortier, Murray Matheson, Hugh McKenzie, Abba Mortley, and Tim Pater. Councillor Straub. I have a question. Um, <laughs> I guess to the deputy clerk, because she was there, and if, if she does not recall, maybe to the chair. Uh, this item was deferred at the nominations committee until the tourism board was incorporated, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And it was, we discussed these uh, nine uh, names uh, at the time, or we did, there was no discussion? Uh, there was a discussion. Uh, the Kingston Economic Development Corporation had submitted names. Not all of the names submitted by Kingston Economic Development Corporation for Tourism Kingston are the nine you see before you tonight. There was some discussion and there were some changes. Okay, so this is, th this is coming to us right now as a result of the fact that the date March 1st has passed and they are now incorporated, therefore we can uh, move forward with the names that we chose at nominations. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Neal. Just very quickly, uh, going over the list of names, there's some excellent choices here and I think uh, the recommendations of the committee are are, are great and I will support this. I also, um, although any organization can offer, as the library board sometimes does and others, some recommended appointments, I think it's important that council maintain uh, the, the, the privilege of doing those final appointments. And so I applaud the committee for doing so. Thank you. Thank you. So we will call the vote. <clears throat> and that carries. Nothing from Committee of the Whole tonight. We have no information reports. Miscellaneous business. Uh, motion number one, that the resignation of Ms. Fran Denby from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee be received with regret. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Osanek. <clears throat> please vote. And that carries. On to new motions. I will turn it over to the Deputy Mayor for new motion number one. I, I accept the chair, and I'm recognizing uh, whoever wishes to speak to this. If you can read the motion. Oh, yes, I can. I'm sorry, it's been a few months since I deputy mayored. Uh, whereas the city of Kingston has held a can Canada Day celebration at Grass Creek Park on the afternoon of July 1st for many years, and whereas the downtown Kingston BIA has been holding a Canada Day celebration, including fireworks in downtown Kingston for many years, and whereas the city and other partners, such as downtown Kingston BIA, 
uh, Canadian Forces Base Kingston, Kingston Accommodation Partners, and the Kingston Immigration Partnership are celebrating the sesquicentennial and wish to pull their resources together to provide the community with an enhanced and more accessible Canada Day celebration in the downtown core. Therefore, be it resolved that Council direct staff to work with other partners and relocate activities from Grass Creek Park to the downtown area to provide an enhanced Canada Day experience highlighting the 150 uh, Canada Day celebration. And now I'll accept uh, questions or comments. Yes. As the mover, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, there's no question that uh, Canada Day celebrations in Kingston are always fantastic and always varied. Uh, of course, we have our red and white people parade uh, down Princess Street uh, in the, the afternoon. We have a civic ceremony that's always very well attended by our community. We have a number of other activities that go on, fireworks here, of course, in the evening, uh, and always a great uh, family-oriented celebration at Grass Creek Park, and I always try to make it out there uh, every year for Canada Day as well. But there's clearly um, an expectation that Canada Day this year should be something special, something different. It's Canada's sesquicentennial, Kingston is Canada's first capital, uh, so there's clearly that expectation in the community, what are we going to do different this year? And so really this is a a motion that is attempting to, to allow for something special, allow for something different. It's not taking away from uh, the, great, uh, the great programming that goes on at Grass Creek Park every year, uh, but this is just to allow for something different. And really, I think that the vision here is to create a, a walkable uh, festival atmosphere between different locations in and around the downtown. Uh, we're expecting a much larger crowd than we otherwise would for Canada Day, so I think it's really from both a, a practical point of view, uh, but also from, a, from a, a festival creation point of view that uh, we could do something very special this year. Uh, and since we did pass the uh, City Hall lighting uh, earlier tonight, uh, of course that would be the unveiling of, of that, uh, that lighting, so it's certainly something that's meant to run throughout the day and into the evening as well. So. Uh, so I think that uh, this is a, just a chance to be able to do something memorable for the 150th and uh, certainly hope that Council will support it. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Neal. I just wanted to follow up with that and, and in seconding, and I'm happy to second this motion. And, and the whole idea was just to kind of put a little bit more effort into a centralized area and pool the resources with some of the other organizations, as, as the mayor mentioned. And this, the idea of this wasn't to make a permanent change. It was just simply due to the 150th anniversary. So I just wanted to allay any concerns of that going forward as well. Thank you. Thank you. And anybody else? Yes. Councillor Hutch. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I think those are good reasons, and um, I appreciate those arguments. I'm a little uncomfortable when you're taking something away from one area, and especially when you're putting it downtown, okay? <laughs> Even though I represent where this is gonna take place. It was fought long and hard to get that celebration, Canada's celebrations out there in the first place and there was fireworks I don't know if that continued but there was there at some point so and I also note that we don't have a countryside counselor <laughs> at the moment yeah yeah sure you yeah <laughs> I know where you live the uh, but you are doing the work I'll admit to that so um that that makes me so I, I'm wondering if this is like a one-time thing that's my question of the mover and what staff perhaps understanding of this motion is. If I, if I may go through the chair to ask yes. the mover. Uh, so as specified in the motion, it speaks to this only with respect to Canada's 150th celebrations. So the idea is that this is a, a one-time change. Okay, then celebrations will go back to Grass Creek is okay. I, I can see where you're, what you're pointing to here, but it was not entirely clear. So okay, I'll take it as clarified. Um, so I think that's 
that's basically it. I just wanted to be sure that uh, we weren't just taking something away and it was going to stay like that and that we're going to go back. So and I think for the 150th anniversary, we can justify it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I guess just to follow up on that last point a little bit, um, will there be greater enhanced access to transit, shuttle service, that type of thing for this day to ensure similar to the Tragically Hip event, that, that a big downtown event accommodates people from other areas. I don't know who that's going to, but. Yes. Ah, thank you. Uh, the commissioner, I think, has her hand up. Thank you, uh, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. So uh, the answer is yes, in terms of accessibility. One of the concerns that we have heard um, definitely uh, over the past years and, and in preparation for this particular celebration is the fact that Grass Creek Park is not accessible for a number of people that do live within the city and do not have vehicles. Uh, so having this uh, celebration that is fully accessible in terms of transit and we will work with Transit Kingston in terms of um, making sure that uh, people do have access to these celebrations in the downtown core. Thank you, and I will ask our former deputy mayor to take the chair, if, I, if I she could. I take the chair and I recognize you. Thank you. I share the same concerns and, and I'm reassured by the fact that this is recognized as a one year, a one off. And uh, clearly it's a very different, I, I, I go to both events as many people do, but going out with your family, on a nice day, spending a day in the park, listening to live music. Uh, that's a very different experience than everybody kind of, and I have to say crowding into the downtown core for organized events. I appreciate that this is the 150th. Uh, like the two previous speakers, I am willing to support this for this year. I was going to move an amendment that, or ask if it was a friendly amendment, that this clarifies that this is for this year only, but we've had that public commitment from both the mover and the seconder. So uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. But I would hate to lose uh, that family very family friendly event that used to take place, I believe in, in Councillor Bohm's district that now takes place in the countryside district. So uh, as a one-off, I can support this, but clearly I think we need to uh, support Grass Creek uh, for this event in the future. Thank you, I return the chair. Thank you, and uh, final speaker. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you for, for the comments from Council. Uh, again, very, very sensitive to that issue, so that's why I, I reached out and had a discussion with, uh, with Councillor Bone before bringing this forward to make sure that it was communicated in a proper way. Uh, that again, that uh, we're very pleased with, with how celebrations have gone at Grass Creek Park. This again is just to allow something different. I think I will just respond to one concern. Um, it is in no way intended not to make it as family friendly. It's just a matter of moving locations. And the downtown is a pretty, pretty large area. So we're not talking about cramming everybody into Market Square like in the hip concert. It's a matter of uh, creating an environment that's walkable. Uh, but that could be a large area, and so that you, there are other green spaces, I think, that certainly uh, can be considered for that. The other point that I will make, uh, part of what has contributed to this idea coming forward is that uh, CFB Kingston wishes to play uh, an enhanced role in our Canada Day celebrations this year. And so certainly for them, uh, this makes more sense in terms of encouraging more military families and others uh, in the base to also be able to, uh, to participate with the rest of the community. So uh, with all things considered, uh, I think it's a good move. We look forward to a very exciting Canada Day this year. Thank you. Thank you, and I will call the question.
And I return the chair. Thank you. Just note that the uh, motion does carry. Um, new motion number two, moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor McLaren. Whereas Kingston is a community rich in heritage that ought to be preserved, and whereas a tax credit would seek to limit the destruction of Kingston's heritage buildings, and instead encourage the rehabilitation of these culturally significant buildings, therefore be it resolved that Kingston City Council add its voice to those requesting that Parliament adopt Bill C-323, an act to amend the Income Tax Act Rehabilitation of Historic Property, and that this request be sent to the Prime Minister of Canada, the leaders of the opposition parties, MP Mark Gerritsen, and municipalities Ontario, larger than 40,000 residents. Councillor Turner. Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I don't usually bring these uh, bills or these motions to council, but this one really struck my interest because I thought this was really relevant to council and, uh, and also to the city of Kingston since we have so many heritage buildings here. This is basically a bill, uh, it's C-323, and it would give a 20% tax credit for the restoration of historic places. It's a private member's bill, and it's, um, it's by Peter Van Loan, and what it would entail, it, it would entail homeowners or people that want to renovate their heritage infrastructure to, to receive 20% off of their tax bill. So it, it's, it would be great for our community. It would generate uh, economic uh, viability and help them to help them create or to fix their homes and uh, also help to renovate and restore and possibly grow the their property values and occupancy rates in the future. So I think it's a win-win for everyone. I think it's a win-win for the community. And I think if uh, we could get this to the to the Prime Minister and to pass it through the House, I think it would be benefit uh, everyone. So that's my two cents, and I hope you all vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McLaren. Thank you. I'd also like to say that this is actually going to be an incredibly great benefit to Kingston, and especially to Kingston, perhaps more than other cities. Um, we are a very rich heritage community, and I believe I've heard the statistic that on a per capita basis, we have the second number of, per, of uh, heritage properties in, per capita in Canada, second only to Quebec City. So heritage, as you guys all know, I'm sure, uh, creates a sense of place and uh, contributes to the self-identity of people who live in it and people who experience traveling around and seeing the architecture. But it's also, in addition to these higher order values, it helps with economic development. We're talking here about an, a federal income tax credit. So this is not going to hurt our tax base at all, but it will repatriate money that's being taken out of our community in the form of income tax and being distributed somewhere else. It re 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 brings it back into the community such that we can create income for more people here. This is an economic benefit. This is pure economic development in the simplest sense. And the fact that it helps heritage actually aligns higher order values with the lower order values of economics. This is a wonderful thing. It's very rare that this kind of happens. Usually they work at cross purposes, but not in this case. Now it's also extremely important that we do this because as uh, was mentioned, this is a private member's bill from the loyal opposition. And as those go, they tend to have a track record of not getting through the government. And we have a certain privileged position here in the sense that um, people have listened to us in the past with basic income guarantee and fentanyl. Perhaps they will listen to us this time because it really is a good idea and it benefits Kingston much more than any other city except Quebec City. If this were to actually pass, we would actually be, we'd have the opportunity to get much more of this income staying here than most other cities in Canada. So uh, for all of these reasons, I think it's a very good idea and we should really support good ideas no matter where they come from. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Strupp. I'll be brief. <clears throat> I live in the Sydenham, old, uh, old Sydenham Hist Historic District or Heritage Conservation District. And uh, so that money that uh, Councillor McCown's talking about, repatriating a lot of that might end up in uh, actually right in my neighborhood. So for selfish reasons, uh, I like the idea. Uh, the, um, the truth is that if you don't support heritage, it does eventually get demolished by neglect. So uh, any, any, any little bit helps. 
and I thank Council Turner for bringing this forward, and I plan to support it. Thank you. Thank you. We will call the vote on new motion number two. And that carries. Are there any notices of motion? Seeing none, Mr. Kirk, I'll ask for minutes. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Turner, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2017-06 be held Tuesday, February 21st, 2017, be confirmed. Please vote. And that carries. We have some tabling of documents and number of communications. Is there any other business? Mr. Clerk, I'll ask for bylaws, please. Uh, Councillor Hutchison. I would ask that uh, bylaw four be separated, please. We're just going to separate bylaw four for Council Hutchinson, so please uh, just bear with us for a couple seconds. All right, folks, I think we're ready. Um, we will, uh, uh, bylaw four has been separated and those will be uh, voted on first. So the, um, excuse me, the numbers that, the letters that you see may be slightly out of order because we've added two bylaws at the outset. Okay, so moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Osanek that bylaw four be given its first and second reading. Oops, sorry, it's not showing. So this is the vote on bylaw number four. Yes, first and second reading. Please vote. Councillor Hutchison. Okay. 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 Councillor Hutchison. Thank you. Um, I've asked this to be separated because I have difficulty with it. The um, it's this this. Bylaw is 
not being before us really except as a, it's a delegated authority bylaw. And it allows for um, the, for a allowance for a small amount of property that runs up the side of the Bailey Broom factory. It's like, I've described it to people like if you split a golf tee in two, the sharp end would be towards Rideau Street. The thick half of the thick end is at the east end of the building or a little bit beyond it. The problem is, is that we, it's twofold. That it's there to facilitate the WSE. And we have a motion that we passed um, well, a couple of years ago that indicated that we would, um, that staff could not obtain property to facilitate the WSC uh, in, without the permission of council. And so, in a way, that's what this does. We own the land, we sold the land, now we're taking it back as an allowance. We don't own it in a legal sense, but it comes under our control. The uh, main principle of property is, do you control it? There's other philosophical aspects to it and legal aspects to it, but the basic thing is, do you control the land? Which this attempts to do, because it will, in case Catarockway Street needs to be widened or a turning lane be put in, according to the engineers, which I, I got to talk to because they send you a special letter when it happens in your district. So <clears throat> I think this is, a, this is a housekeeping measure. It can be done anytime. Right now we're doing the North Kingstown secondary plan. It will, um, you know, have a lot to say about whether a WSC is necessary or not. And um, I've talked to the engineers at length about that, as you can imagine. So what I'm saying is that we don't need to pass this right now. And I've tried to explain the niceties of this to a um, couple of residents, and uh, it's not possible. It's, we're taking it. It's going to be used for the WOC. I think it violates our understanding of the motion that we passed previously, and I personally cannot vote for it. Um, so I think if we don't pass it, it can come back when the secondary plan is done in about a year or so, and if necessary. Like I say, it's a housekeeping item. We don't need it right now. And, uh, and I don't think it affects whether we have the WSC or, or not in any substantive way right now. It will be important later. And presumably it can be folded in with considerations of that when the time is more appropriate. So I, I'm asking council to um, not pass this and to vote against it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Neal. Just quickly, um, if I could ask for a ruling from the chair, would this indeed require reconsideration? Now it's over a year, uh, so it would just need a simple majority, but I believe before we vote on this, wouldn't it require a reconsideration because it's contrary to a motion, albeit two years ago, but passed by this council? Uh, perhaps the clerk can comment. Mr. Clerk. So, so Deputy Mayor, the, the rules of council are such that if, uh, if we vote it down, that it can't be, well, we can reconsider it with two thirds uh, for 12 months. After 12 months, then it can be revisited and it would just require a simple majority. But not a reconsideration? 
because it's established policy? Uh, Mr. Clerk, can I see one more time? Deputy Mayor, can you clarify that question? So you said it's contrary to established policy? Yeah, I thought when, when council create, passes a motion and creates policy, in this case, no purchase related to uh, that, that in the first year it requires a two thirds majority for reconsideration. In subsequent years, it's just a simple majority for reconsideration. I, I may be wrong on that, and that's why I'm looking to the clerk can for I, guidance. But. Okay. Can, can I get an answer from staff? Is this contrary to a motion of council that was passed back in 2015? Ms. Agnew? Uh, thank you, and through you, this is actually not under my delegated authority. It would be under the director of engineering, um, I believe, but... Um, as far as I recall, the motion related to the North Kingstown secondary plan, if that's when we're talking about it, it asked staff to go and undertake a secondary plan that considers potential alternatives to the Lyington Street extension. I don't remember the full extent of that motion, though, and all the details. There, there was a motion of council that made reference to not acquiring any additional land with the purpose for the Wellington Street extension. Um, is there anyone from staff that can provide clarity on this, or uh, Mr. Keach? So I'll, I will attempt to. I may not be able to provide the clarity you're looking for. And in all honesty, I had all this information last council meeting, and it got deferred. And I, I guess I didn't think to bring it to this council meeting. Um, so what, what we're looking at doing, and, and, and maybe if, if council is looking for more information, we just need to defer it to the next meeting, and, and I can bring that, or, or Mr. Martin Van Buren can bring it. My understanding is we're looking at two pieces of land here. One, as was described, is the sliver of land alongside the broom factory that will facilitate the uh, Cataraqua Street widening if at what time it happens. That's for the Cataraqua Street widening. There is a tiny little triangle that would be between Cataraqua Street and Wellington Street if it were to happen that would be needed for daylighting purposes. So there are actually kind of two separate pieces of property here. Um, and, and again, my understanding, and, and I wish I'd have brought the material, um, we're trying to get this in place before the transfer of land takes place um, of the broom factory. If um, the Cataraqua Street were to be widened, we would use the land for that. If Wellington Street were to take place, we would use it for that. If neither of them happen, the city would maintain the land, but it would just be there and whoever, you know, that, um, um, owns the property, could utilize it or probably at some point in time do a claim to get it back again. But it, it's, it, I, I will agree it's a bit of a housekeeping item. I think the timing with land transfer and whatnot uh, is, is right to do it now. Um, I, I would be hesitant to just defer this without being able to, to defer it more than to the next meeting without being able to provide more information. And again, I, I apologize. I had all this last week. I just, I didn't think to I, I forgot it was on tonight. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you have the floor. I, uh, I want to give other people an opportunity to speak, but I would support deferral. Councilor Stroud. In the interest of saving time, I'm going to move deferral of this item to our next council meeting so that staff can bring the information that they had brought previously so that they can give us further clarity on whether or not this is contrary to a previous motion of council. So we have a motion to defer, moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor George. A motion to defer to the next council meeting. I'll call the... Your Worship, we're gonna to have to end the vote uh, with respect to um, the first and second reading. So once again, please uh, bear with us. You'll see a rejection up on the screen. And that is not correct. That is just to be able to move on to the deferral motion.
I'm sorry, did we, was that the motion to defer? No. Okay. okay, now is the motion to defer. Thank you. As a moved and seconded, to defer bylaw four until the next meeting. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, with that, the information you see on the screen is now correct once again. Um, so we will proceed with the bylaw votes. Uh, Councillor Candon, uh, if I could ask you to step out of the room for the first five votes. Councillor Hutchison, can you step out of the room for the first three votes, please? ABC. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that bylaw one be given its first and second reading. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that Clause 11.34 of Bylaw 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaw 1 three readings. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that Bylaw 1 be given its third reading. Please vote. And that carries. Councillor Hutchinson, you can return. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that bylaws two and three be given their first and second reading. Please vote. <clears throat> One more. That carries. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that bylaws two and three be given their third reading. Please vote. That carries. Councillor Candon, you can return. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that bylaws five through eight be given their first and second reading. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that bylaws five through eight be given their third reading. Please vote. And that carries. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal.
Please vote. We're waiting for one more. And that carries. Thank you very much.